the Sporting Chance Forum is back, bringing together stakeholders from across the sports ecosystem, including leaders and experts from sports bodies, governments, trade unions, sponsors, and others. 14 sessions across four days, sharing knowledge, learnings, and first-hand perspectives on progress towards protecting, respecting, and promoting human rights in sport. From grassroots sport to mega sporting events, including clubs, federations, and partners of all sizes and from all parts of the world. Be part of the conversation for the biggest ever Sporting Chance Forum and join us live online from the 4th to the 7th of October, 2021. Register now to save your free place. SportsHumanRights.org Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. From wherever you in the world you're joining us today, I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2021 Sporting Chance Forum on behalf of everyone at the Center for Sport and Human Rights. We're live over the next four days with this, the fifth edition of the Sporting Chance Forum, which aims to foster dialogue and collective action on human rights across the ecosystem of sport. For the first time, we're exclusively online. Like many others in sport, we postponed this event last year due to the pandemic. This year's online format allows many more participants from around the world to engage in these discussions, which is important to us at the center as we expand our perspectives on how together we can strengthen sport through human rights. None of us could have foreseen the many challenges the world would face following our last forum hosted at the UN in Geneva nearly two years ago. The pandemic has profoundly affected every family, community, and sport at every level and exacerbated longstanding inequalities. Now all of us have an opportunity to start or continue to work together for better. Later in this opening session, I'll introduce the new strategic plan for the Center for Sport and Human Rights titled Convergence 2025. This plan outlines our vision, values, and priorities over the coming years and lays out a framework for collective action and multi-stakeholder cooperation that we want all of you to be a part of as we make progress towards a world of responsible sport that fully respects human rights. To kick off this year's program, this session welcomes five esteemed speakers who will set out some of the major themes to look out for over the next four days. First, I have the honor and privilege of handing the baton to our chair, Mary Robinson. Thank you, Mary. And welcome everyone to the fifth Sporting Chance Forum. It's my great pleasure to join all of you once again as we share diverse perspectives and advance knowledge on the sport and human rights agenda. I'm pleased that my friends Guy Ryder and Sharon Burrow and the new president of the International Organization of Employers, Michel Parmalee are joining us for this opening discussion, along with professor and athlete activist, uh, Dr. Harry Edwards. Over the next four days, we have a broad and ambitious program to look forward to. With the wide range of stakeholders present from across the sports ecosystem, this forum is the center's calling card for encouraging constructive and courageous conversations in a respectful and safe environment. We all know the scale of the challenges facing the world today, from the climate crisis to strains on economies and public health, all of which manifest themselves in sport and ultimately impact athletes, workers and communities. I'm particularly interested in how we can come together to address and find creative and sustainable solutions to the risks and harms that play out in sport. Past and present acts of abuse, discrimination, prejudice, and marginalization must not be tolerated or accepted and need to be tackled head on. This isn't something that can be done by just some of us, but requires action by all of us that care passionately about the roles that sport plays in society. Each of you has a voice 
that contributes to these important conversations. With that in mind, let me start us off with just a few thoughts that I hope will help frame our discussions over the coming days. Now more than ever, a broad sustainability agenda is emphasizing the links between environmental, social and governance considerations across all sectors, including sport. As part of this, there's growing recognition that adherence to international human rights and labor standards, particularly through robust due diligence measures, is not only critical for success, but essential for nurturing positive social impact. However, sports institutions and traditional models can't do it alone. Governments, corporations, civil society organizations and others have critical roles to play and obligations to meet in enabling a world of responsible sport to grow and thrive. And sports bodies and sport event organizers need to be open and ready to engage in this important journey of exercising their duties of care and harnessing their full potential. Indeed, there is urgency here, not least due to the growth in influence and reach of athlete voices and activism, urging change in and around sport. Today, the entire sports ecosystem is being judged on its ability to tangibly demonstrate and measure how it can be more people-centered and purpose-led. We all need to build on this awareness and progress. The Centre for Sport and Human Rights is uniquely placed to contribute to these broad aims. And our new strategy being launched today explains how and why. The strategy will be available on the Centre's website, and I know there will be more discussions, thoughts and ideas on it soon. Allow me to close by saying a few words about my dear friend, and I know a friend to many of you, John Ruggie, who led the development of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, and who passed away recently. John's dedication to dialogue, learning, and cooperation achieved so much over his long career. And we mustn't forget when we talk about John, about his great sense of humor. I'm particularly happy that among our many joint efforts to promote human rights and sustainable development over the years, John and I together raised the question of what responsibility meant in the context of sport. As some of you will know, in 2014, John and I wrote to then FIFA president, Seb Blatter, to share observations and recommendations from a report on mega sporting rights events, uh, mega sporting events and human rights that the Institute for Human Rights and Business had developed, and to urge FIFA to commit to implementing the UN guiding principles in its delivery of the 2014 World Cup. John's leadership in developing the guiding principles framework has been the game changer in galvanizing our current sport and human rights agenda. His later report for FIFA, acting as a best practice example, acts as a best practice example for a number of sports bodies seeking to embed human rights throughout their governance and operations. I think it's safe to say that there would be no Sporting Chance Forum or indeed Centre for Sport and Human Rights without John Ruggie. We're all in his debt. As we begin this year's forum, let's keep in mind John's notion of principled pragmatism and continue his legacy of embracing that spirit of respectfully engaging, working together, listening to each other, and being creative about where and how we find solutions to make the world a better place. After all, this is a race we must run together in order to win. So with my encouragement to be practical, forward-looking, and focused on solutions, I wish you all every success for this year's Sporting Chance Forum, and look forward to being together in person as soon as circumstances allow. So back to you now, Mary. Thank you, Mary, for your words and your leadership. As Mary noted, we're pleased to launch our new strategy this week. It's been a long time coming and the product of engagement across the entire ecosystem of sport. We'll preview that shortly. But before we do, I'm now ecstatic to give the floor to the legendary Dr. Harry Edwards, Emeritus 
professor of sociology at the University of California at Berkeley, architect of the Olympic Project for Human Rights, and a civil rights activist of global renown. Dr. Edwards, it's an honor to welcome you to the Sporting Chance Forum. I'm grateful to speak briefly with all of you participating online from around the world in this year's program hosted by the Center for Sports and Human Rights. I welcome this opportunity to offer a few thoughts to such a broad range of activists in the sports and human rights communities who have come together not only to focus on making sports a safer place for athletes and fans, but also to discuss how we can work smarter together in collaboration through sports in advancing the causes of equality, justice, and human rights. My life's work has been about supporting athletes willing to use their sports celebrity and stages to inspire positive change. I've often said the playing field is a place to be seen, but it can also be a platform, a place to be heard. Early on in my own scholar activist career, I had determined that because of people's investment in sports, sports could be used to inspire change by changing people's perceptions and understandings of the games they watch and play. I've been privileged to work with many athletes over the years who have shown real courage and commitment to vital causes. Some have put their careers and their very lives at risk to stand up for what they believe and to speak out as frontline activists in the quest to promote social justice, human rights, and better futures for us all. Being such a leader means engaging powerful individuals and institutions. It means working together to get all relevant stakeholders around the table, especially those whose rights have been abused, to really listen to each other and then to work to achieve needed reforms, whether it's in a local community, at the national level, or simply in the sports league. Today, we've seen a new generation of elite athletes who recognize the power inherent in their positions in sports. And many of these athletes are women. We need to pay greater attention to them and to make sure that uh, as they work, we are working with them, helping them to leverage the power that they have uh, on the sports stage, to level, leverage as much money as we can bring uh, to application to the issues and concerns that they have and leveraging our positions uh, as leaders with these world-class athletes in this era. At this time, this is this generation's obligations. As athletes, they need to support each other. We need to support them, especially across lines of race, gender, religion, and class. So how can we all join forces with these young athlete activists? How do we help them become even more influential and informed voices for the voiceless, no less than for themselves and for their sports? First, we need to keep in mind that there's a wide range of issues athletes feel passionately about. Effective advocacy require, requires clear messages and strong alliances international human rights and labor standards that you are all working to advance, provide the global benchmarks that help us all frame and solve the problems that athlete activists are trying to change, from police violence, to abuse of women and girls, to getting out to vote, to addressing climate change, to fostering informed discussions about mental health, medical apartheid, and vaccinations and masking, among many other issues. Let's find ways to share our approaches to making change and work together to make those messages even clearer, more powerful, and more consequential. Second, we need to uh, think more about how to responsibly and effectively use the tools of our collective toolbox to achieve uh, these aims. The world of public activism has changed enormously. We see this most clearly in the scope of access and of use of the social media, which for all of its problems has also had the greatest influence on the trajectory 
and the impact of athlete activism. Without the social media, it would have been, it would have taken years for athletes of today to create that climate of change that we now see. Today's athletes can use their social media platforms to mobilize in ways that Muhammad Ali, Tommy Smith and John Carlos, Arthur Ashe and Wilma Rudolph, among many other champions for change of the past could have never imagined. Athletes are speaking up most often uh, and when they have done their homework, they know what the problems are. But as uh, has been the case uh, in the past, entering the public arena in this way comes with risks. And it can, be a hard, uh, it can be hard to face the onslaught of criticisms and threats that sometimes result. So the more we can use our tools, the tools that we have as organizations, as individuals, as collaborators to support and protect each other, especially these young athletes who are standing up and speaking out, the stronger we will all be. Lasting change is going to require all of us who are committed to sports and human rights work to come together in new and better ways as we discuss issues and put people first in everything that we do. I'm gratified that there's a forum like this where those discussions can happen. We need to look at this as a stage where we can begin to express our support for these young athletes and devise new and better ways of doing it. So thank you all so much again, and thanks to everyone at the Center for Sports and Human Rights for bringing so many people together who are committed to this important work toward the end of creating not only a better sports environment and experience for all who uh, partake of it, but also for uh, committed to the work of creating a better world. Thank you so much. And I trust that you will have uh, a great uh, experience in this conference. Thank you, Dr. Edwards, for your powerful message. To keep us moving in this opening session, continue to frame our agenda in the broadest terms, I now have the pleasure of giving the floor to the Director General of the ILO, Mr. Guy Ryder. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be able to join you today and let me start by congratulating the Center for Sport and Human Rights on its new status as an independent non-profit organization. That and the impressive and varied expertise of the new board of directors equips the center very well to step up to the many challenges and opportunities ahead. And I'd like to acknowledge also the leadership of Mary Robinson and of Mary Harvey chair and CEO respectively for their work which has paved the way for the next phase of the life of the Centre. Dear colleagues, the new structure for the Centre was established at a most appropriate moment just before the opening of the Olympic and Paralympic Games in Tokyo and many of us saw those Olympics as a return to something like normal life for top level international sport after months of cancellations and disappointments due to COVID-19. And for these most unusual games, the official Olympic motto was altered slightly to faster, higher, stronger, together. And the word together emphasized the human focus of the games and the interdependent nature of humanity. And this has also been one of the most important lessons of the pandemic, because during the pandemic period, well-known athletes raised human rights issues. Governments, sponsors, partners and fans also paid more attention to fundamental work-related rights. And rights issues in sport are now being reported more often and receiving greater public and media attention. The Centre has made an invaluable contribution to all of this, not just by bringing attention to the issues, but by working behind the scenes to identify problems early and to open channels for the dialogue needed to tackle them. And this work is helped by the Centre's unique structure, providing for the active participation not only of sports associations and governments, but of businesses, trade unions, sponsors, broadcasters and UN agencies, 
It is an extraordinary collectivity of stakeholders. And their capacity to work together cohesively for shared goals is, I think, the best measure of the potential added value of the center. At the same time, the UN system has also stepped up its work to promote human rights in sport. Uh, the ILO's Global Dialogue on Decent Work in Sport held last year is just one example of this. And like every other aspect of human activity, sport was hit hard by COVID-19. But in multiple ways, sport has helped and is helping all of us to get through the stress and the constraints of the pandemic. Fortunately, safety protocols enabled some large sports events to restart. And in many cases, these safety measures were facilitated by active social dialogue. Social dialogue, which also lies at the heart of the ILO's own modus operandi. Last June, our membership, that's governments, workers and employers, used it to agree an ambitious and innovative framework for a human-centred response to the COVID-19 crisis. We call this the global call to action. And the call to action offers a negotiated plan for an inclusive and sustainable recovery from COVID-19, one that also builds resilience against future challenges and shocks. The measures it recommends are as relevant to the world of sport as to all other areas of human activity. And I would invite you to work with us in its implementation. Ladies and gentlemen, the ILO is proud to be a founding member and a permanent formal observer at the center. We will actively contribute to the 2021 Sporting Chance Forum, in particular, to talk about child protection and about our work to improve fundamental rights at work in Qatar, where the FIFA World Cup will be held in 2022. The government of Qatar has been working with the ILO, our employer and our worker constituents and with other key partners on a comprehensive labor reform agenda. If implemented effectively, these reforms can leave a very important legacy for the World Cup. And they can also serve as an example for other countries who want to host mega sporting events. That is what we must aim for, because sport should celebrate the best of humanity. We owe it to everybody involved in sport, to ourselves and to future generations to ensure that fundamental human and work-related rights are fully embedded in the sports ecosystem. And this forum can certainly advance that process. So I wish you all success in your discussions. Thank you. The entire labor rights system has been engaged with and supported of the center since its inception. And we seek to embody this tripartite plus approach of engagement, dialogue and partnership in our work. It's therefore my pleasure to now go to a message from Sharon Burrow, General Secretary of the ITUC, speaking on behalf of the international trade union movement, the workers. Sharon. Greetings. This is a day to celebrate. The fact that the Center for Sports and Human Rights is born, it's in place, it's doing amazing work with uh, Mary Robinson having shepherded it through as uh, the honorary chair and of course John Morrison and the incubation role that the Institute for Business and Human Rights played. We thank you. This is new global architecture. And you couldn't have a better CEO than Mary Harvey. She herself knows that the struggle to be a champion, the struggle as a woman to be a champion and to be recognised as a professional with all of the respect that should entail, including salaries, decent working arrangements and indeed uh, health and safety. This is a fantastic uh, place, Mary for you to lead. The composition, the diversity of people who've helped bring in this new form of global architecture. This is indeed a proud moment for all of us. And the ITUC is particularly uh, welcoming, but also very, very proud to be a member of this body that can do so much good. Because sport can be a real force for good. And there's, there's lots of examples where it has been. 
But tragically, there's also lots of examples where indeed we've seen corruption, discrimination, exploitation, a lack of safety for uh, women, for young sporting athletes, for athletes more broadly, a lack of freedom of association, and of course the same for construction workers in many countries, and the dehumanising exploitation often in the supply chains. We can do better than this. A trillion dollar industry alone in supply chains, without all of the other wealth it generates through the television broadcasting rights, the payments for athletes, the sponsorship, we know that not just indeed the workers, not just the players, but the fans and indeed the sponsors want to know that sport can and will be clean. So I can only say to you that this centre has indeed a critical role in our world. It's actually supported by not just uh, indeed uh, governments, and workers through their unions and employers, through indeed the IOE and the sponsors themselves. But it has those sporting bodies who've committed to human and labour rights, who are committed to anti-corruption as part of the structural equality of the membership of this centre. That's remarkable. But what's even more remarkable is that we show that multilateral institutions the International Labour Organisation, the ILO, and the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the OHCHR. These are international bodies with the authority to both establish, in the case of labour rights, global standards, and to monitor and report on the state of human rights in all walks of life. We know that this centre, with people committed to the sporting rights uh, principles, the sporting chance principles, I should say, if they're not just on paper, but they're embedded in the work and the commitments of people who are involved in the centre, if we're committed to eradicating the areas of discrimination, of sexual harassment, if we're committed to to workers, to athletes, to those people who are indeed in the service of the sporting industry, having a voice, having the freedom of association, to have a voice, to organise, to bargain collectively, and to be free of discrimination and forced labour, then this is an example for a world we want. The ESG principles, the principles of good governance, of social standards, and indeed of environmental standards, apply to everybody. The UN business and human rights, these principles for indeed due diligence, for grievance and for remedy, this, these sit at the heart of the way we should conduct business everywhere. So today I say thank you to everybody, congratulate all of us and now make a commitment along with the rest of you to actually give the centre the place in our global architecture it deserves. Thank you. Thank you Sharon. Having heard from the voice of workers, we now of course go to employers and machines. Michelle is the president of the International Organization of Employers and also the deputy CEO and chief people and purpose officer of Deloitte Global. Michelle, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Sporting Chance Forum. Thank you so much, Mary, for that introduction and for inviting me to this incredible event. It's a pleasure to be with you today in part because I'm a big advocate of sport and also a sports uh, fan myself. I played volleyball and basketball in high school. I was not a star athlete. And at one point I thought about quitting to focus more on my schoolwork. My coach told me something though that has stuck with me to this day. She said she would only let me quit if there came a time when I didn't learn something during practice or a game. 
Needless to say, I never quit. I learned things playing sports that I never would have learned in a classroom. I also said I'm a sports fan and there are a lot of sports I enjoy watching, but nothing comes close to watching my home team, the New Orleans Saints, an American football team. It has always been my favorite father-daughter activity. While the Saints can break your heart, they unite our diverse city of New Orleans like nothing else. Our players become attached to our city and they endear themselves with our fans by giving back. Our recently retired quarterback, Drew Brees, is a prime example of the impact an athlete can make on their community. He's a hero to us, not because he brought us our first and so far only Super Bowl win, but because of what he's done for the city of New Orleans. Sports just light a fire under us, don't they? And I think this group in particular understands something essential about sports. They're about so much more than physical excellence. They're about human excellence. We saw proof of that over this past year. We saw it in the teams across the world standing up and sometimes kneeling down for racial and gender equality. In Simone Biles and Naomi Osaka matching their incredible physical strength with mental strength by having the courage to step away when they needed to. And in the Olympics, which brought a global community together during a time when so many of us felt isolated. More and more, we're recognizing that physical feats are just part of what makes sports extraordinary. Our biggest sporting events now celebrate people not only for going faster, growing stronger, reaching higher, but becoming more just, more empathetic, more cooperative. It's been incredible to watch because there's a similar awakening underway in the corporate sphere. Just as we've come to recognize that sports are about so much more than physical excellence, we've come to recognize that business is about so much more than financial excellence. The crises we have endured in recent years and will endure over the next generations have proven that businesses can ill afford to operate without regard to the impact they have on the communities around them. Athletes show us that we cannot separate our physical health from our mental health or the health of the communities around us. The same is true of financial health. Businesses thrive when societies thrive. So single-minded pursuits of profit alone cannot lead to long-term sustainable success. That's why the most successful companies are guided not only by profit, but by purpose. At Deloitte, we've been stepping up our efforts to build productive, equitable, inclusive societies, both because it's the right thing to do and because we recognize this provides the foundation for our success. And as more and more businesses reimagine how they operate, sports sponsorships are a great place to start. Gone are the days when sponsoring a team or event simply meant stamping your name on a jersey or arena for greater visibility. In this new era, we should cultivate more meaningful, sustainable partnerships that have the strength to endure. There are three ways that we can evolve how we think about sponsorships in service of that goal. First, as teams and companies focus on their broader purpose beyond physical and financial success, corporations should seek out athletes and teams where that broader purpose aligns. When deciding whether or not to sponsor a team, it's worth taking a closer look at their advocacy programs and community service efforts. We should support the teams that are actively promoting the values we cherish and think deeply about how we can work with them to make an even bigger impact. Sports have always touched on, sometimes even sparked, larger conversations about who and what matters in our societies. Athletes use their platforms to stand up for virtuous causes and lend their voices to urgent calls for justice, fairness, and equality, and their sponsors can help them further those worthy goals. For instance, Deloitte U.S. sponsors the U.S. women's national soccer team, which inspired 
the She Believes campaign. This movement empowers young women and girls to believe in their own power and achieve their dreams, whatever they may be. Deloitte, in support of that shared goal, sponsors the annual She Believes Cup an international women's soccer event. We can reinvent corporate sports sponsorships into a brighter future where athletes and their sponsors work hand in hand to advance the common good. Second, we should recognize that when we sponsor athletes, we are not just sponsoring physical talent. We are sponsoring human beings with complex lives. Athletes face what all of us face, stress and anxiety, setbacks and hardships, and many of them must also grapple with discrimination, whether it's due to their race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, or some combination. So as their sponsors, we have a responsibility to create safe spaces where they can be fully human. This means proactively prioritizing and promoting their mental health, ensuring that their voice and agency are protected at all times. It means offering public support when they're forced to make tough personal decisions about the bodies, their bodies and their careers. And even after they retire from sports, it means continuing to support their well being. For the longest time, the athlete's journey has been thought of as a certain three-part narrative arc, aspire, inspire, retire. The athlete aspires to greatness, inspires the world with their achievements, and then retires to a life with the so-called glory days all in the past. At Deloitte, we don't believe that's true. We share the center's view that there's a different story to tell, aspire, inspire, and thrive. The end of an athlete's sports career is far from the end of their lives. That's why we've brought multiple Olympic athletes to our Deloitte University leadership and development centers to help them imagine the next phase of their journeys. Whether it's entering the business world, pursuing a new degree, or continuing the advocacy work of their sports career in a more substantial way, sponsors should support whichever path they choose and provide the support that will fuel their thrive. Finally, we should recognize that great sporting events have the power to connect us like little else across sectors, across countries, across cultures. And as sponsors, we should use our influence to ensure that these connections advance human rights and dignity for all. Take the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar. After Qatar won the bid to host the World Cup, stakeholders raised serious concerns about the treatment of the workers who would make this incredible event possible. Now the country is passing significant labor reforms, including a new minimum wage and better protection rights for migrant workers. Sponsors can continue to use their influence and resources to hold the Qatari government accountable for these reforms and ensure that events like the World Cup advance human rights for all people. So before an organization agrees to sponsor a major sporting event, they should ask, how are the workers going to be treated? Is there a plan for the facilities to continue supporting the surrounding community after the event is over? Will all athletes and fans, regardless of their identity, be able to speak their truth throughout the event? By asking these questions, sponsors can ensure that the connections these events help forge leave us more just and more equitable, even after the event has concluded. In life and business, the relationships we nurture with each other and the teams we build to solve our most pressing problems make all the difference. For centuries, sports have understood and modeled that truth. And today, more than ever, they can play a powerful role in galvanizing widespread support for a wide range of efforts. Sports, when done right, can help unite our communities and countries. They can provide us lucrative opportunities to forge connections around shared goals and prove we are stronger and more successful when we work together. In the end, we don't just need teamwork to win medals and championships. We need teamwork to overcome the biggest challenges we face and build a future we can all root for. So thank you for having me today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the forum.
Thank you, Michelle, for those remarks, which capture some of the changing ground we're seeing in the whole sports ecosystem and the opportunities in front of us. I'm also proud to be a, a Deloitte alumna as well. Having heard from our keynote speakers, this is a good segue into giving you all a preview of the center's new strategy. Our intention with the strategy is to convey the character of the center and our unique approach to working with all stakeholders, as well as to inspire collective action to address common challenges that we hope will inform our discussions this week at the forum. Here's a short video to introduce Convergence 2025. Sport is a celebration of human potential and achievement. Every event, however large or small, requires many different stakeholders to make it happen. There are the event organizers and hosts, local and national governments, civil society and human rights bodies, and many others working to promote sport in wider society. They all have relationships that can impact human rights. At the heart of sports are the people who make it happen, who can be impacted differently depending on who they are. It's a complex ecosystem that needs to be engaged in courageous conversations and collective action. Human rights are a live issue for the world of sport. When human rights aren't protected and respected, sport's capacity to be a force for good is impacted. We are a human rights organization for the world of sport. We exist to realize the prevention of human rights harms and violations, promote access to effective remedy for those who experience human rights abuses, and create opportunities to promote human rights that benefit all. We are generating awareness so that institutional actors increasingly acknowledge and commit to their duties and responsibilities. We are building capacity so that stakeholders can better prevent and mitigate harms. We are creating lasting value so that everyone can better hold each other accountable and communicate progress. This is a race we must run together to win. Our work through 2025 will support the convergence of all those in the sports ecosystem to work through the lens of human rights. We will enable people to deliver and enjoy sport in a harm-free, sustainable environment while recognizing and rewarding catalysts for good. It's a vision for responsible sport. Let's work together and create a fairer, better future for all. Sport is where humanity can really shine. And human rights are the very foundation of a better world. So there you have it. Let's work together. Let's work together to bring a human rights-based approach to our work and work toward a world of responsible sport. I'm particularly proud of our call to action, together for better, and hope that this ethos guides us through our next four days of discussions. Before we close this opening session, let me give you a taste of some of the discussions to come and how you can participate. For this year's forum, we've shaped the agenda around four key tracks, big issues, practical solutions, future sport, and the essentials. You can navigate your path through the forum by following any one of these tracks, live or at your leisure, or taking all four routes through the forum. The big issues are key topics that command our urgent attention right now. Later today, we kick off with a groundbreaking session that aims to generate awareness on the dilemma of fairness, inclusion, diversity, and respect, we examine how sport policy can be more inclusive to transgender comp competitors and those with differences in sexual development. Second, we offer the co-creating practical solutions track. And on Tuesday, we start that area by asking members of the sports ecosystem to work collectively on the delicate but important topic of safeguarding the well-being of affected persons throughout the remedy process. This session will examine how to ensure that approaches to remedy are informed by the lived experience of survivors of abuse. Third, we introduced Future Sport, where the center is starting a collaboration
collaboration with other thought leaders to explore issues on the horizon for sport and human rights, whether that's on matters of sport, climate resilience and human rights, rights of child athletes to be protected from exploitation, or considering emerging trends such as the explosive growth of women's sport and of e-sport. Finally, we have the Essentials Track, where we have attempted to enable those joining us for the first time to build their capacity and start or continue their journey in human rights. And today at Midday Geneva time, we begin with a session that aims to support sporting event host cities and countries with how they can initiate a human rights-based approach. Across all our sessions, we've attempted to put people at the heart of the conversation. If COVID has taught us anything, it's that sport is nothing without the voice, agency, and energy of the people that make sport happen. Whether that's the athletes, fans, workers, journalists, coaches, local activists, or members of host communities at big and small events alike. It's a lot to cover. A couple of final points before we get started. First, at previous Sporting Chance forums, we have had representatives from sport youth networks participate or give their views in person. This year, we're pleased that a number of young people have joined the center to do work experience with us, and we have asked them to produce a post-event summary. In it, they will be offered a specific youth lens on proceedings at this year's forum, as well as recommendations on ways to strengthen the youth comp contribution at future Sporting Chance forums and the wider work of the center. We look forward to sharing their analysis with you. Second, I want to acknowledge some shortcomings in how we're delivering this year's event. Every year, we try to embody what we ask of others in the sport ecosystem, including with respect to inclusivity and diversity. This is our first virtual forum, and while all sessions can be viewed with closed captions and translations soon after the recordings go live, we need to do better with participants with disabilities and with non-English speakers so they can participate on an equal basis in real time. Also, it's incumbent upon us to ensure that our forum reflects the world of sport in all its diversity. Due to a few late changes on some of our panels, we've fallen short when it comes to ensuring racial or geographic diversity across every panel. There's a logistical element to this, but it also caused calls for us to pause and reflect on our shortfalls in our own networks and the pressing need for inclusion and diversity as a top priority in all levels of sport. As you engage with the forum over the next four days, please do let us know if there are any other areas where we may have missed the mark. We promise to do better next year. So with that, and with my thanks to our keynote speakers, I look forward to learning together with all of you over the next four days. Let's get started. There are three more sessions just today with a next session starting in just under an hour. Please use all the functionality we have on this online platform to engage, network, and ask questions, and to amplify these conversations by connecting with our social media accounts and using the hashtag SCF21. Thank you and enjoy the forum.